these people that are working in the trade, uh, the people who are doing the trafficking, I just want to see if I can get just a little understanding of who those people are and how they became involved in this kind of trade. That's a really good question. These are also people who are, you're always hesitant to call someone a victim when the people that they are victimizing are arguably in a much worse situation. But they are also victims of poverty. Um, People who are desperate, they've grown up in a society where they have no value. And so they don't really have a moral compass. And we know this because the prices that are put on these girls' lives are so low. When I actually went and visited Bangladesh and visited some of the hostels there, um, we were told about a couple of girls who were rallied up just a couple of days before. Five girls sold for £50. £50. £10 for someone's life, their entire Mm -hmm. life. So I think it's safe to assume that the people who are doing this, um, they lack that moral compass, but they themselves are in some sort of dire situation. They're also desperate. Today, I was talking with Rachel Byrne. Rachel Byrne is 29 years old, and uh, she is working with her family foundation, the Byrne Family Foundation. And they set up hostels in Bangladesh and Nepal for children who have been sex trafficked. And uh, I had a conversation with her about this. I was learning all about it and what they do. Uh, What they're doing is really um, on the ground and helpful. And uh, so I thought, well, I'm very uh, honored and grateful to have been able to speak with her and to share with you what they're doing. So thanks very much. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Tommy. How are you? Very well. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on my podcast. Um, Thank you. We were put in touch with each other and uh, I was very pleased to know that I could have you on my show and teach me and my viewers about what you're doing. Um, I think I'll start just by, you sent me a little bit of a bio and we're just going to read it and then we can get started with our conversation. I look forward to it. So this is Rachel Byrne, 29 years old from England in the UK and at the center of a business that she has had the privilege to work in alongside her family. Helping others has always been a core value. Her family foundation was set up 10 years ago, and she's enjoyed getting involved in many local and overseas projects. The biggest contributions going towards hostels and schools in Bangladesh and Nepal, which rescue and protect children from sex trafficking, black market organ trafficking, systemic violence against women and degradation of the untouchable community. Since visiting both locations and spending time with almost 500 children there, this particular case is one that she's been moved by. And I'm just going to let you tell us about that. Um, Your latest project is a completely self-funded building project to provide safer living conditions for these children. So let's start... Let's start with this story, just so that people have the same kind of introduction that I got to who you are, and then we'll get into some questions. Sure. So, again, firstly, thank you so much for having me. Um, It's a topic that is hard to talk about, and I think it's one that, living in the UK, I've had quite a protected life. Uh, We have good infrastructures and things like that. So, when this issue was first raised to me it was when I was working for one of my family's companies um, and I'd been brought up around parents who really valued helping others so I'm very grateful for that and it's given me a lot of opportunities Um, but within the business we had contacts with other charities or individuals who were looking for some help in the work that they were doing and because of this we set up our family foundation at the time it was called the Checker Trade Foundation, which was the company that we ran. And um, through some connections, through some churches and individuals, it was brought to my dad's attention about a particular organisation out in Bangladesh. And I'll be honest, I knew very, very little about Bangladesh. I I wouldn't have even known that it was a country um, at the time. And 
we were approached and asked if we would consider helping out with this organization it's called hope house and we were uh, told some stories about some of the individuals that they had helped and these were things that i had just i had never heard of before um again i lived in my little bubble and i was told this story about a young girl who she had been trafficked and i'd never heard of the term trafficking i didn't know what that was all i knew from the end of that story was that this girl had essentially been stolen uh, like her human life had been stolen and at a very young age about 12 years old she was forced into prostitution um which is insane you know i'm sitting there at the time and i'm thinking about my younger sister and how old she was and thinking what <laughs> i just mm -hmm. can't really comprehend something like that happening to a child um being forced to perform for adults much older than her um coerced with violence and i think the thing that really got me was when i heard of what would happen to her if she didn't comply and this particular young girl she would be tortured she would be put into a bath and she would be electrocuted until she subdued and that's a very shocking story mm -hmm. um and as soon as you hear something like that you like you know how not only wrong it is but just how extreme like, again you just can't quite comprehend it happening to someone like your little sister and so i think i speak for all of us who were in the room at the time because it was within the business talking to all the employees all of us just thought there must be something that we can do there must be something that we can do and that's very much how i was introduced to it um so hook line and sinker straight away i was my heart was invested how old were you were you 19 oh yeah i was probably around 18 19 at the time yeah, yeah. wow yeah. wow that's quite a uh, responsibility to take on at that young age but good for you yeah definitely and i think it did help that having done previous charity work or being exposed to things like that you know when i was younger my parents would go on missionary trips and things like that so i was aware of some of the not so bright things that happened in the world but that particular day i do remember my heart like sinking like you said feeling a responsibility that i wanted to do something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um maybe you could tell our guests uh, what human trafficking is now that you know what it is what what is it for them so human trafficking is essentially the recruitment or movement of individuals, humans. Um, within this context, it is predominantly females um, and it's done via coercion. Often there will be like abuse of vulnerability involved. There's threat or you know, threat of violence, things like that. Um, and these people are, most of the time, they are sold into this idea that they will be, be provided with a better life. It's mostly people who are impoverished, people who come from the lowest classes within their societies. Um, but human trafficking itself is that it's, it's the movement, the selling and trading of human lives. And how much of an issue do you think that is in our in that in that vulnerable community? So it's really hard to say just because these statistics they're really hard to attain um, because this is illegal, <laughs> um, as right. I'm sure you expect. Yeah. The statistics are difficult to maintain. A lot of it will come from either like censuses or um, charities that have stepped in and helped um, or people who are doing their own research and they, they select groups of people. Um, but it is estimated that around, particularly in the countries that we work within, so Nepal and Bangladesh, around 400 per month in Bangladesh um, the statistic over the last 10 years, they believe it's been about 35,000 people. Um, and in Nepal, it's it's similar. It's a similar issue. It's a, it's a similar scale. Hmm. I'm curious to know how you, these people that are working in the trade, uh, the people who are doing the trafficking, uh, I just want to see if I can get just a little understanding of who those people are and how they became involved in this kind of trade. 
That's a really good question. These are also people who are, it's, you're always hesitant to call someone a victim when the people that they are victimizing are arguably in a much worse situation, but they are also victims of poverty. Um, people who are desperate, they've grown up in a society where they have no value. And so they don't really have a moral compass. Um, and we know this because the prices that are put on these girls' lives are so low. Mm. So um, when I actually went and visited Bangladesh and visited some of the hostels there, uh, we were told about a couple of girls who were rallied up just a couple of days before, five girls sold for 50 pounds, 50 pounds. Mm. 10 pounds for someone's life their entire mm -hmm. life so i think it's safe to assume that the people who are doing this um they lack that moral compass but they themselves are in some sort of dire situation they, they're also desperate mm -hmm. and that that's something that's a very i think that that because that is the way it is that's something to keep in mind as our conversation mm -hmm. goes forward that we're dealing with uh, a problem, a society problem, and uh, and poverty yes. is a, These has a lot to do with it. Exactly that. These aren't people who have a, um, a high standing within their community, within society. They're not empowered people. Um, they've just kind of, I don't want to say they got lucky, because obviously not, but they go under the radar because of the lack of infrastructure in those sorts of countries and because of the you know like we said the levels of poverty there it very much goes under the radar hmm. Hmm. well that's hmm. so do you think so bangladesh and nepal so are these bangladesh and nepal population only or are these people that are coming from other countries are they being trafficked from other countries very often they are trafficked from other countries um within india and its surrounding bordering nations it's very like that's that is a common theme is that people will be moved from one country to the other um because it's it's easier and they can move them away from their family they can isolate them it is very common for people to be passing over borders when they are being trafficked right because then they can't just escape and go home easily exactly right. that exactly i see that. It makes right. rescue missions really difficult. Um, as an example, another lady that I had the honor of meeting, um, she was sold by her family. And again, that just demonstrates the level of poverty and desperation mm -hmm. that these people are in, that her own family would sell her, probably believing that she would have a better life, um, mm -hmm. that she would be earning her own money. Um, but she was sold to someone. She then married that person had two children but then she was forced to walk uh, work in brothels um and she got to a point where she could not take it anymore and she actually ran away she ran away leaving her children behind mm. she was found on the brink of death in a ditch um and very luckily she was found and she was rescued um and but it got back to us again at the business that we worked at at the time it got back to us that she had these two children and immediately we were all like, well, how do we get the children? How how do we get her children back to her? And the rescue mission was immense because she had been moved across the borders because she was like she was owned by someone else. Um, that definitely, I would say, is something that, that helps these people that are doing that. They're, they're not silly. They know that by moving them away, it makes it more difficult for people to escape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, so that's quite a story. So... I'm curious about the uh, the government and the uh, societies and how they're set up and why these people are so impoverished. It's a huge topic and a huge question. You know, I find myself asking the same things and you try to look into the history of these countries or why there is such a lack of support and infrastructure the exact reasons are really hard to say. It, it goes back hundreds and thousands of years. Um, but one thing that is it still exists today is the caste system. 
So this is like a class that referred to as caste system within mostly Indian societies and cultures um, and their surrounding areas. These come from um, some of the religions or the popular religions around there. You look at the traditional female role. The traditional female role is one of submission. It is one of being meek and mild, which as that filters down through the generations, it makes women a very easy target. Um, you know, they unfortunately, that uh, people abuse that power, if you like, or say power, but people abuse that role of the traditional female. Um, so certainly we see it trickling down through religions and even where the religions are perhaps filtering out, dying down through the generations, it's culturally systemic. Um, and in terms of governments, again, where these countries for so many thousands of years have lived in such great states of poverty, um, you see corruption within the governments. So, for example, prostitution is illegal in Bangladesh. It is. Um, or within certain um, countries, it may be legal, but you have to sign an affidavit to say that you're entering it of your own free will. Regardless, more often than not, even if it's legalized in that country, you're dealing with minors. These are young girls who certainly cannot consent um, of their own free will to enter into this industry. And they lack the infrastructure within the police. They don't have the security. Um, again, it, it's kind of a economic cycle of in this country, our taxes go towards those things. It goes towards policing. It goes towards healthcare. There's a system in place for people who are unemployed. They don't have that in those countries. It doesn't exist. Um, and when we're looking at that caste system again, all of these people that we're talking about today are referred to as untouchables. They are mm -hmm. the lowest of the low within their society. And now discrimin discrimination against caste was, they, you know, it, it is now illegal. You in theory, you can have legal action taken against you for caste discrimination, but because of that lack of infrastructure, nothing's followed through. It is still very prominent in those countries. Yeah, I read, uh, now I can't remember the book I read. I should find that. I'll find that in a minute. Um, it, they were talking about the caste system and the untouchable mm. and how the belief in the caste system was that if you were of, and tell me if this is wrong, but if you were of a lowest class, then that was your karma. And there was nothing that anyone should do to change that karma because that was God's will. Mm. And that, so that was your destiny for this lifetime. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so if, so if you interfered with someone who was, an untouchable then it was it was more interference than helping so how so when you get into a situation where you're dealing with people who are of that caste in that society how do you get in there and be helpful without disrupting like the fabric of that society how do you do that that is such a great question. And um, I think that you're right. I believe that what you've said is right, is that it is very much culturally and religiously ingrained that, that that's just the deal. And like you said, if you interfere with that, you could be interfering with with the, your destiny, what you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to be. Um, I think what has helped us in, in terms of the work that we do is that a lot of the hostels are run with a Christian influence. And so it kind of, at the very least, it starts to change people's beliefs in themselves and their value and what their life should or shouldn't be. Um, it kind of opens up their eyes. And you are right, though, that there are, there have been times when we've gone in for uh, rescue efforts and rescue missions, and some people will not leave they won't leave because they do believe that that is their deal. Those are the cards that they've been handed and that is the life they're destined for. We see this very much within Nepal. So there's a particular group of people that we work with called the Bardi people, the Bardi community, um, a beautiful community in ways. Obviously their lifestyles 
um, are nothing like what we would accept here. But beautiful people, I believe Bardi comes from the word or the translation, people of music. Mm-hmm. And you can very much tell when you meet them that they are the people of music. Um, I remember when I visited dancing with these girls and just thinking, how are these girls such good dancers? Um, but they are very much brought up expecting that that's what their life is going to be. Young girls from as young as, as like eight years old will start to be taught by their mothers how to perform, um, how to please. And it's what their mothers did and what their mothers did. And it's accepted. Um, a lot of people just, they, they do accept that, that that is their role within their society. And it's really hard to challenge that. And I think, Oftentimes, it's not until people reach a point of desperation or exhaustion or they realize that, actually, even if this is meant to be, I don't think I can do this. Um, You know, I I saw a statistic about the average number of clients, and this was was a survey, a research that was done, and there's a research paper on it, Um, but the average number of clients that um, people who'd been trafficked into sex work would see and the average is 2.6 a day which at first I was like oh okay <laughs> it sounds crazy that in my head I'm like oh that's not too bad that's not too many but <laughs> that's insane that's an insane amount of people to meet to be used by to have to please um so I think it you know I ha- there has to be a certain point at which they just can't take it anymore. And when someone does offer an alternative or they say, you don't have to live like this or your life is worth more than this and you challenge those beliefs around karma, you know, some people will jump at that. Other- others will not. Others will not. So let me see if I got this right. So um, these girls mm-hmm. from Nepal and their music and their dancing they're trained to be they're trained to be dancers mm. yes or are yeah, they trained musicians to, and dancers are they trained to be prostitutes are they trained to be yes. prostitutes they're trained yes, to be prostitutes absolutely. okay yeah. i see yeah okay yeah. i was thinking about um, research that i heard about it was years ago it's different but it's uh, someone from the, the first world goes to Africa to a, a place where there has been no uh, modern implements. Mm-hmm. It's very much, uh, it's just, uh, they're working on the land uh, yeah. and they have no uh, tools. And mm-hmm. the uh, first world people come in and they say, well, we're going to, here's, here's an ax, right? Yeah. Here's an ax. And, they brought axes and they let them in. And that meant that the people who had now had axes were like, they were people still of that society, but now they were like gods because they had an implement that was going to transform who they were and what they could do. And they found out, you know, and this was a long time ago, how disruptive it can be to come in with a new idea yeah. that they've never thought of and that's not been put into their society before and how disruptive that can be. So, and, and, and I know about the missionary work and um, I think that's amazing. As uh, Another question I have is, are there Bibles there in their language? So has Christianity gone in there as a missionary and had the Bible translated into in Nepal and in Bangladesh? I'm not aware if that's happened. So those are two questions at once, I guess. <laughs> sure. So um, your most recent question about the Bibles and the translations and things like that. Um, yes, there have been. And um, like I said, the organizations that we work within are, they are predominantly like Christian companies um, mm-hmm. or organizations. So they definitely have that influence and they definitely use that as helping to bring more value into these girls' lives. But there is resistance, as you as you've just said um, with that example, there is resistance. I think more so with the older girls and the adults, certainly with the men behind it all, certainly. Um, that Yeah, that can cause a lot of problems. Um, but for the most part, as well as the rescue missions, we have the preventative measures as well. So we do try to 
get to these people before they've entered into that lifestyle at a young enough age that they are still moldable, I guess, um, in the sense that we can get in there and explain to them that there is something else, there is something more. Um, but it, you're absolutely right that there is resistance. These cultures have been around for thousands of years. Um, and with the untouchables, there's another word for that um, class. It's uh, in Indian, Indian Sanskrit, I believe it's Dalit. And it's believed that that has been around since about 400 CE. So you're dealing with thousands of years of tradition and culture. Um, but we just have to hope, and it certainly does happen, that we'll at least touch a few people, you know, out of maybe 200 that we get to talk to. Maybe one might start to challenge their lifestyle and their culture. Um, and, and that does happen. And it's unfortunate that it does take it into the point of absolute desperation. You know, if we could get to people before that point, that would be fantastic. But you do end up speaking to people in such a desperate state that they will listen and that suddenly the cultural values do go out the window and they're like, I'm going to listen to this. <laughs> I'm going to see what there is because it can't be much worse. So tell me what, what it is that you offer to these people in your hostels. Sure. So first of all, just the safety of a home is huge. Um, a few things that a lot of people may not know, but like Bangladesh specifically is one of the worst affected countries for things like climate change. Their monsoon season causes devastation, complete devastation. And it's one of the reasons why we have actually had a project to rebuild one of the homes um, that we have there. Um, um, what's my trail of thought suddenly? Well, you're talking about what, what, um, what you oh, guys well, do in your hostels. So how do you help the victims that come? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned, there is like a preventative program, which tries to enter into these communities, give them an alternative, um, and active rescue missions where those are brought to our attention that someone is trying to escape. Um, so that's anything from like arranging the transportation for them, raising funds to buy them buy them back which sometimes feels a little bit counterintuitive you're like am I contributing towards this practice but it's the only way sometimes is to buy back these lives um and then within the hostels we do provide schooling um they're taught English I was so impressed with the English that these young girls spoke when I visited I was I couldn't believe it. I was like, I, language is something that I really struggle with. <laughs> um, but they see it as such an opportunity for them, schooling, learning English, getting an education. It's something that they value so much because some of them have never had it. Some of the schools that we have out in Bangladesh, it's the first generation that is receiving an education, which for us is great in the sense of like, Although it's not a magic fix, because again, we know that there's issues with the infrastructure within these countries, the opportunities for work are sparse. Having that education is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, so it's mostly security, um, food, schooling, um, and they do get looked after spiritually as well. So what's the average age of the girls that you uh, find and rescue? I would say the average is probably around 13, 14. Um, but when I visited, I think the youngest that I met was about five. There was a set of twins. Oh. They were five years old. Um, so again, that would have been preventative. That would have been, they wouldn't have entered into that work yet. But um, the, their mother would have been very heavily involved in that work. Or they may have been orphaned. Um, and then the oldest girls, um, probably around 17, because once they start to get to that age, um, because they've been provided with this education, they have a hope for their life and what they can achieve. And they do move on or they take over looking after the younger ones. You know, that's what a lot of them, a lot of them do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, these girls are in Bangladesh and Nepal. Um, mm. If they are 17 and they now know some English and they feel like they have hope, where can they go and what can they do? What are, the, what are their opportunities? 
If they have the money, which is rare, they can go on to further schooling. Um, as much as in these more rural areas, like I've said, that there isn't much of an infrastructure, there, there aren't much in the way of earning opportunities. In the cities, there are more. Um, like with any any country, like that, there are places that they can go, and so these are kind of the things that they aspire towards. Um, if they can um, learn to speak English and they can get um, a, a good enough job to start saving some money, that means that they can move to a place where there are are more earning opportunities. That's what they do. A couple of them are very inspiring as well. I remember in Nepal meeting one girl, and she said, "I want to be the president." Like that is what I want to do. I want to change this country. And I just thought that's that's incredible. And that's very inspiring for someone to want to do that after their experience and actively work towards it. I'm very lucky as well that the organizations that we work with, somehow they are beating the odds in terms of these people are also originally from untouchable casts. But I don't, I don't know how, I don't know what's caused it, but they've worked their way up to the point where there are people who will listen to them. By no means are they seen as a normal citizen, but they're getting their foot in the door with certain other organisations. And, you know, if enough people rally together to want to see this change in terms of this discrimination in the caste system, it's progressing. It is. It's very slow. But it is progressing and there are those opportunities. They're just few and far between. So that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that we continue on that side to make sure that these doors stay open for these young girls and they they can go forward and make a change. Now, um, poverty is a, a very tricky subject, right? Because uh, no, no one is for poverty, right? So we're all ho- hopeful for people to have adequate food at, and and a, and a, a bed yeah um, so you know that's what you want for everyone yeah but the but these people have poverty how is their um uh, what kind of what kind of do they burn what do they burn for fuel do you know what people? i don't actually i don't actually know um when i was there we were transported in cars um mm-hmm. but i'll be honest i don't know the answer to that question hmm. I'm just curious um, lot- to know if it's uh-huh. wood or coal or uh, if or if there are any what the natural resources are, you know. So, well, but- I mean, within the areas where they don't have access to things like gas and electricity, I would assume that it, it's mostly wood, considering the environment that they're living in. Um, like I said, in when I visited, that there are cars. Mm-hmm. Um, depending on how rural you go it becomes less and less and certainly the average person would not own a car they'd be cycling around on on bikes and things like that um and they do live in houses that that don't have access to gas or electricity um right. and that's but what they're very to. warm climates are they very warm or are they high up and cold so In Nepal, it's a little bit more varied. It is very hot, but being near the Himalayas, like it does get very, very cold um, Mm -hmm. at night. And, um, you know, there have been times where I remember at work, we all rallied around to send out coats to these children because it was so cold at night. Mm -hmm. Um, Bangladesh, again, it's a very hot and humid climate. Um, But I didn't know until a couple of years ago that, as I mentioned earlier, they're really badly affected by the monsoon season. So it can be very, very wet, it's very dangerous. A lot of lives are lost during the monsoon season. Um, so you have the issue with dealing with the immense heat with people when they um, don't have adequate housing and then the very extreme colds or the very extreme floods. It's really varied. Right. I'm curious So what do you find are your biggest challenges in your enterprise? What makes it difficult for you to move ahead with what you're doing? One of the challenges is one that one point that you raised really well, there is still resistance to help. Um, And the people who are running these brothels, they're not the friendliest of people. It's really challenging when you're confronting it head on within that close space. 
it's very difficult. And certainly having someone like myself go in or even a man, uh, a white man walking in, immediately you're an outsider. And um, that is something that is best left to the people who who live and work there, who understand the culture, were brought up in the culture. On top of that, there is just the the cost of all these things. So as we've said many times, like poverty is huge out there and there aren't many earning opportunities. Simply housing children is really expensive. Keeping them fed is really expensive, even though they eat some of the cheapest foods available. You know, they'll happily survive on rice. But the cost of inflation in these countries is unlike anything that we've ever seen in our own country. It's really extreme. As well as that, the last few years, they were really badly affected by COVID. So within the social groups and because of the way that they live, often multiple families will live together um, in one unit. It, again, was devastating. Um, a lot of lives were lost. Thankfully, um, most of the children within the hostels that we had were kept very safe um, and anyone who did have it managed to recover. Um, but certainly inflation, things like a global pandemic, um, again, the climate change issue around um, the flooding that Bangladesh um, experiences each year is really extreme. But mostly it is just battling that social, cultural norm um, and challenging it. it. It's a very difficult, very difficult topic and subject to, to overcome. Now, does it is does anyone work with? So you're dealing with the population of the girls, but then there's the population of the men who are using this industry to support themselves and their families and their communities, right? So, yeah. is there is there any work being done on that front? Us personally, it's not something mm -hmm. that we've got involved no. in, and I'm not. I. I struggle to believe that there really is much support for them because, again, I don't want to excuse um, the way that they exploit other people, but they're doing it for a reason. And these aren't people in high power. Um, they're not people who have a lavish lifestyle by no means. They themselves are desperate. Mm -hmm. What we do do, though, is so we have a girl's house and we have a boy's house. So the boys often are the children of these victims of sex trafficking. And I think it's really, really important that more is done with this. So these boys to prevent them from one growing up believing that that is the norm and that is okay. And that is the expectation that they end up doing something like that Two, again, providing them with opportunities for education, providing them with earning opportunities, whether that's helping set up a barbershop, which is something that we've done, or providing goats to a family so that they can produce and sell goat's milk. The, the, the boys, these children, unless something is done with them, with them we're just going to carry on this socioeconomic cycle. Right. Um, so again, like the boys' house and the girls' house, we focused on the girls, but we want to make sure that whilst we do continue to try to tackle those who are currently in those Positions of power, if you like, not power in the sense of governments or anything like that, but the ones who are exploiting others, um, and, you know, they will use violence to do that. They use, will, they will threat, threaten, um, everything's under a guise. Um, we want to make sure that we're not allowing another generation to be brought up that same way. And whilst it feels like just a drop in the ocean, we're hopeful that that will have a ripple effect and that again, by providing those opportunities for these young boys, they can be the start of a change. That is definitely our hope. We don't want to leave them to fall into that same trap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, as, as Christians, as Christians, then uh, there's a, you know, every, every soul is sacred, right? Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't, we're saving the, the best in everyone. Or that's our mm -hmm. hope, right? Is to save the best. It doesn't matter who they are. Yeah. We hope we hope that there can be some redemption and atonement. And, Absolutely. Uh, moving Absolutely. forward. Yeah. And again, like as I've said, these these men who are 
in charge of these organizations that are exploiting people again i i don't want us to gloss over that they they do need help um as much as a lot of the focus is on rescuing efforts we need to be more preemptive and like you said we need to make sure that we're not dismissing them as humans um that they are still maintaining their autonomy um giving them life and value and that really must be the foundation for the change I believe mm -hmm. rescue mm -hmm. efforts are fantastic and it saves people, but we've got to get to the root cause. We've got to get to the core. And of course we can't just, we need the help of governments. We need the help of infrastructures. We need more people to contribute towards these efforts. But I love to think that if we can start with those boys, those boys who have been brought up or are, are the product of, of rape and prostitution, and it's all they've known, we can start with them. I hope that we can create that into something bigger. And like you said, not forget that they're victims of poverty and their cultural norms as well. It's just what they know. I've been, this is, this is just a little bit different, but I've been thinking about the, um, um, you know, in my, in our society, how safe we feel and how well mm. we're taken care of, but yet still as a child, uh, there might be things that happen so that you don't feel always safe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, and maybe it's just that your parents work at night. And so you're alone a yeah. lot at night. And even that you're alone. So then you grow up with a feeling, a slight feeling of a abandonment, say, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. um, these, these small deviations from the uh, feeling of being in the, in, in uh, God's hands and being safe, if you're mm -hmm. not feeling that way, uh, it takes away your uh, joie de vivre, so your your ability to play and be in a playful spirit. Yeah. And so I'm wondering about these little girls that you can, can you see that playful spirit uh, come back for them? Have you seen any of that? Yes. So, it became really clear um, when I visited some of the hostels which girls were newer and which girls had been here, been there for a longer time. There was very much a timid, timidness uh, about the newer girls. They were still very quiet, closed off. Um, and the body girls who are taught to dance and perform, you can see as well that for a while it, it take it takes time for them to loosen up again because they've been taught that as a means to serve men um and to serve the people who own them and initially there's probably a little bit of shame around that as much as it is their cultural norm once they're taken out of that and someone says no that's not okay we don't want you to do that anymore naturally there's a little bit of shame around that but in time with nurturing with love, with providing consistency for them. I think consistency is really important in them feeling secure. By providing that in time, you do see them lighten up. And the girls that I met were an absolute pleasure to me. They were so full of love, so full of gratitude. A lot of them had never seen a white person before, um, again, because they live so ru rurally. And because they are untouchable, to them, someone like us or someone from a different caste, even entering into their home is just mind blowing for them. And it shows they they want to they, like they want to show you their bedroom. They're like, come and sit on my bed. Like for them, it's an honor and it's really strange and it's very conflicting. But at the same time, it's so beautiful to see that they are genuinely capable of loving. Like they have learned what love is um, and they are capable of loving back. And um, they want to perform for us all the time. They're always wanting to show us like plays. They're always wanting to sing for us. To see children like that and to remember where they've come from and what they've been through. It's, I don't think I can really put it into words. It's heartwarming and it is heartbreaking. Um, but certainly we are seeing that they do they do start to perk up. They Once they can embrace and appreciate that they are secure and they are safe, that light and that playfulness in them does come back. And it, it's beautiful to see. It's a real honour to have seen it. 
So do you follow, how, how long do you follow up with them once? Because you've, so you've been doing this for 10 years, right? Yes. So the kids that you uh, rescued 10 years ago, are you still in touch with them now? So or some of them, some of them, it's usually through our contact there. So we'll get regular updates from our contact who actually works in the hostel, um, mm -hmm. is sort of responsible for the main work who report back to us. Um, and when I say main work, I mean they physically look after the children. Um, mm -hmm. So we get updates regularly, as well as new cases. They'll tell us about the ones that have, have moved on. Um, I often ask for updates on the twins who I met because they just, mm -hmm. they stole a little piece of my heart. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we're lucky that with that contact we have, um, that we, we are regularly updated. And for the most part, it's usually, I don't want to say a happy ending because there's still so many issues for them to overcome within their communities and societies. But certainly it seems that we have been successful in ensuring that they're happy um, or happier and that they're doing better than they would have done um, if we hadn't stepped in. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's very tricky eh, to be helpful. Mm. I, have, I have found, you know, if, if you have uh, resources and you want to share them with with uh, people who don't have resources. Um, you want to make sure that that they're able to benefit from the resources that you've given them, right? So you you want to make sure that these girls have benefited from the freedom that you're yeah. giving them. Yeah, absolutely. And sort of the idea of like, you know, they turn seventeen, eighteen, and like off you go. Good luck that's a really scary thought and so that's that's why I think we have such an emphasis on trying to make sure that we're not just housing and feeding them for a time you know that that classic saying of like give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day give him uh, you know teach a, a man to fish um it's very much that within the hostels there is a great effort to ensure that we're gearing them up as best we can for life outside of the hostel it's hard and again, the challenges around potentials for earning and jobs is really difficult. And that's something that we can't do on our own. We can't change hundreds or thousands of years, years of culture. Um, efforts in terms of political efforts to try and make changes is really, really difficult. And not that we're not trying or not that we're not getting people involved to help us with that. But there's no denying that... Um, the hostel is a safe haven, but it won't be there forever for them. At some point, they're going to have to leave. And I think perhaps one of the most um, valuable things is them learning English. The opportunities, once someone can, can speak English, are huge out there. Um, and, you know, setting up things like the barbershop, setting up companies that they can then run and they can integrate into society again, but at a different level is so important it, it's so so important but it, it is very challenging right so you'd have to i mean there, there's got to be uh, uh industries that are uh, i don't know if there's um, um textile a, a type of textile industry there's got to be yeah and so yeah. some of those some of those they, things they could learn those Exactly Perhaps. that, learning, learning skills, things that we might still consider within our societies like low paying jobs um, or like factory work. Um, yeah, over here, that wouldn't, we, a lot of people would be resistant to doing that, but they're skills that they can learn and it's a way that they can look after themselves and have a secure income. So skills within textiles, things like nursing. Mm -hmm. um, things that are always going to be around and always going to be needed, those are definitely things that are emphasised within their education and schooling. Do they have telephones? Um, the children don't tend no. to. Mm -hmm. Again, just from an affordability point of view. Um, but as they get older, where they are able to start earning a little bit of money through various jobs, as much as we're gearing them up for these different industries, um, you know, sometimes they are able to get small jobs, um, some of them will purchase them themselves. But for the most part, the children don't have them. Is there currency through the telephones? I know in some um, places in the world there's currency through the telephones. I would say in the rural areas, definitely not. Definitely yeah. not. Um, it's It will all be cash-based or 
it will be trading of animals mm -hmm. still things like that it's right. it's still very much um they haven't caught up with the technology yet um which in some ways you might think is good and in other ways it's it, it holds them back um right. i think right. there are, there are pros and cons to both yes well it's complicated technology yeah it there is. was a there was a someone uh, online suggested someone had a phone they said, I'm going to take your phone and you're not ever allowed to have a phone again. Mm -hmm. How much money would you want for your phone? Right. For, okay. <laughs> like what, what, really is, a <laughs> what yeah. is a telephone wor worth? You know, it's worth way more than we've paid for them. Yeah. If you could never have another one. Yeah. That's a really good example for someone to or illustration to put out there like you said um for us our phones it's it's access to the rest of the world most of our opportunities you can find within our technology um yeah. so that is definitely something that it is preventative for them um by not having those means um but again you know most of the children being around 12 13 i don't think that's so much of an issue for them but no um, no that's a later get, that's a later problem yeah that's that's an issue for later on yeah i'm curious about the flooding in bangladesh how yeah. how has the flooding changed do you know because i know that they've always had a trouble with um they've had monsoon seasons um, yeah. and and this is something that happens in that part of the world Yes. But how, do you know that it, it has changed in the last few years? So from and what I've worse? heard, yeah, from what I've heard, and again, this is this is word of mouth through our contacts there, it mm -hmm. seems that the level of flooding, it's now affecting more areas. It's, it's flooding to the extent that more areas are becoming flooded, um, creeping into residential areas and things like that. Um, and it, I, I do think that for the most part, it's just that it, it's more intensified. Um, the rain and the monsoons are, are harder. They are um, harder to manage. Um, so, for example, for many years, that one of the boys' houses that we have there, you know, as, when the monsoon season hit, um, it didn't hit them. And then in recent years, it started to affect them. And each year it kind of got worse to the extent where, we had to build a new home for them. Um, they couldn't continue to live there because it was too dangerous. Um, so from what I know, word of mouth, it's definitely got worse in those areas. In terms of statistics and things like that, I, I don't have that to hand, but yeah. their experience has been more extreme over the last few years. So did you manage, you manage to build a new building for the boys then? Yes. So what we did first is we temporarily rehomed them we found mm -hmm. somewhere to rent um, during the monsoon season. They were then able to um, dry out the home enough that they could move back um, once the monsoons had dried out and things like that. Um, the girls' house, we completely... So with, with the girls, there are more girls than there are boys. And um, in terms of rescue efforts, there are more mm -hmm. girls than boys. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we did is we rebuilt a home for the girls, knowing that they would need a larger accommodation long term. So at the moment, I believe there are 36 girls in that house, uh, in this one particular house in Bangladesh. Um, but there's room for 70. And then what we've done is we moved the boys into the girls old house. Um, but over time, that has become very worn. It's not as secure as we would like it to be. Um, because even with these children being moved into these secure homes, there is still the threat of them being mm. stolen. Um, that's very much a possibility. Um, as well, unfortunately, people knowing that it's a, a Christian organization, they do become targets um, because they are not of the traditional either Hindu or um, Muslim culture they, that those countries usually have. And they do become a target sometimes for that. Um, but yeah, so the girls' house redid that completely, made sure there was room for plenty more girls in the future. Um, they're schooled from within that house. Um, and the boys moved into the girls' house. The girls' house now uh, that the boys are in, um, th they need a new home. Um, again, like I was, I was getting into, like the security is just, it's not good enough. It's not big enough. Um, their toilet facilities are outdoors, which again, is just not secure. Um, 
So we have decided and we are currently in the process of rebuilding another home for the boys, um, which is a big project. <laughs> um, so we believe that it will cost around 250 to 350,000 because another one of the challenges with inflation is the cost of materials. It fluctuates all the time. So that's why it's it's such a big difference. Anywhere from 250 to 350,000. Um, and this one so far is entirely self-funded by the charity. Um, and that's not accounting for things like furniture and appliances. So beds and, and cooking facilities and things like that. That's not accounting for that. Um, but yeah, so the, the boys' house is the current project that we're working on. So we have a lot of people listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. and some of them are going to be thinking the same things that I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. And so I think uh, if I wanted to do, if I wanted to be helpful, yes. what could I do if I wanted to be helpful? Sure, and that's exactly what I asked when this first came to my attention. And, of course, I was lucky that I was involved um, in, in the charity and that we had the means to help these people um, in a way that was all legalized and you know there were regulations and things like that um, and because this isn't a single issue there are so many things to overcome here it's really difficult to know where to start you know again look at the political issues the corruption within the governments or the policing or the lack of policing so where these practices are illegal but nothing's being done about it when I start to think about that, sometimes I get a bit overwhelmed and thinking, I don't know what I as an individual can do. So within that regard, anyone who's motivated or moved to help in that way, help, that's sort of the bigger picture thing where, you know, if we could get those governments involved, I'd make a huge change straight away. Start to look at, um, you know, the people who are rallying for things to change in those countries. Look at the political leaders who are backing um, rescue efforts such as this. They're few and far between, but, you know, writing to politicians. I always think doing something is better than doing nothing. So within that regard, that's what I would recommend. When we're looking at the socioeconomic crisis over there, this is a really difficult one to overcome. We know that poverty has always been around. And like you said, we all, we all want everyone to have adequate living conditions. No one likes poverty. No one likes that idea. Um, there's a reason why we're moved when we see adverts or hear stories of how these people live, um, because we know it's, it's, it's not right or it's not fair. Overcoming poverty on a big scale, anyone's guess is as good as mine. <laughs> um, but I do think, and this is where we, we've kind of honed down our efforts, I do think that looking into ways that you can support uh, either individual or bigger organisations. So we're an individual organisation um, in providing schooling, education, a safe place. Look for the places that are helping the men as well as the women and places that can actually provide future earning opportunities. So it's all well and good supporting the children, us giving them enough money to feed them and clothe them. But we have to think ahead to the future and the bigger picture. And how do we make those changes happen? How do we change generations and generations of, of culture and tradition? Um, and you have to start somewhere. And I do think that the best place to start is in supporting those efforts. Um, if we could eradicate poverty overnight, these these things would would half if not if not more than that um because it does come from a place of poverty desperation that's why they trade that way that are the victims um so i think whilst there may not be one life-changing thing that someone can do these little avenues are great go and look for the uh, either bigger organizations that work within this or you know if anyone wants to help out our foundation in particular the burn family foundation um, we can guarantee all monies go directly to that. It's all regulated. Um, it's all within the laws of both the UK and Bangladesh and Nepal. I think we just have to get our foot in the door in these things. Education, opportunities for earning, just helping people live a better life. And it seems small at times, 
But to these people, it's their whole world. It's their whole life. Um, and that's what I focus on. If there are times where I'm like, oh, are we doing enough? What like what can we do to make a bigger change? I try to remember that to these individuals, it is their whole life. Um, so yeah, organizations that are doing good work. Um, you know, if you are moved to right to political leaders and things like that, absolutely. How we're gonna overcome poverty globally, maybe we never will. Um but we can certainly try to help individuals or groups overcome the challenges of poverty that lead them into this industry. Yeah, well, I think working at the local level, like you're working at the local level, yeah. is is the way to absolutely make a change. And you know of Bjorn Lomberg, he's an economist who does a lot of research on um, trends, economic trends. Yeah. And um, he uh, reported that that the number one way to uh, help society would be is to educate kids. Yeah, you know that that the payback of that. And then there's another man named Marion Tupi who runs humanprogress.com uh, .org, humanprogress.org, and uh, he's another economist who's who's uh, uh, does a lot of research uh, trying to find trends in in the world, and mm -hmm. he's just shown that for every child born. They create seven times the economic worth. So, wow. you know, people sometimes think that uh, children are uh, um, are are, co are are a cost, but they're mm -hmm. not. They're a benefit. So, yeah. yeah and the, and what you're doing is you're, you know, you're saving these these children and giving them an opportunity to be helpful in society, and yeah. and they will be. Yeah, because absolutely. every one of these kids has the potential to be seven times as helpful as as just one of as just one person can be. So, exactly you know, what you're that, doing, exactly. I think, is wonderful. Thank you. I mean, it's it's an honor to be a part of, and as heartbreaking as it is, um, it's something that it it sits on my heart so heavily, and so I do consider it a real privilege to actually be able to. Whilst I'm not there in the trenches on a day to day, like getting involved in those people, the people who are affected and the people who have the ability to to change, um, the the people on the ground level, um, it's a real honour to actually get to meet them, speak with them, and help them, and hopefully it's part of something bigger in the long term. Well, the thing is, you know, being at the local level, if there's a uh... I'm sure there's biblical scripture about this, that in order to to try to be at the highest, you have to be down here at the lowest. There has yeah. to be a connection between the day, the every day, every day. Yeah. But you're, but you're, it's, it's like being a bricklayer and thinking about whether you're just putting one brick on the next or you're building a th cathedral, right? So, mm -hmm. It, it's the idea. It's the idea behind what you're doing that is uh, elevating, and uh, yeah. that's powerful. Absolutely. It's powerful A work. Absolutely. And you think, you know, just the common example of Jesus and who he associated with, and the people who were his friends. He wasn't up there with the powerful leaders. You know, he knew that he needed to connect with the broken, with those that needed his help. That that's where the difference is made. Um, and like you said. You lay those foundations, but you're thinking about that cathedral. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a really beautiful analogy. I think that that's a great place to stop. Yeah, I think absolutely. that it's it's been oh, it's been such a pleasure to meet you and to hear about what you're doing. Uh, it's something that uh, we, you know, we don't know much about. So now we can oh. put this word out there, and and uh, people will understand more what's going on. That's great. Yeah, and I really appreciate you having me. It's it's a topic that means a lot to me, and I'm sure it will affect other people. Um, and having the chance to meet and speak with you, it's it's been a real privilege, and I really thank you for that opportunity. Well, and once 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 it comes out, I'll notify you, and um, you can read some of the comments. Who knows what people you know what kind of comments we'll get? So exactly. it opens a door, and it's another door that can be opened. It does. So. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure.